It's the day that we have been waiting for for so long. It's here. It's finally here. You excited? Yeah. Everyone excited? It's the it's it's the time. It's that time of the year. Dude, the Oakley kids are this. all in school. Yay! Oh yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. All of them. This is the difference so between moms years. and dads. Maybe I don't know. You you don't seem as excited. No, well, my my kids have been in school. Well, Julie's too. Our kids have been in school, but then they brought all the germs back. <laughs> mm. So we're dealing with the repercussions currently. So once we get through the repercussions, then we'll be good to go. There yeah, go. mine has been, I was excited to send them back, but you also kind of forget the first week stress. It's been a little stressful here. They're not used to it yet. There's lots of things on the schedule. There's homework. It's been a whole, it's been a whole thing. We're just apparently they know how fragile kids are in Ohio because they only have to go to school for one or two days, depending on their age. And then they get a weekend off. Mm -hmm. So nice. we did that last week. Easing into men. Yeah, I'm excited. Well, Kevin, you're going through the same thing I'm going through basically, which is like a new school and a new experience mm -hmm. for your kids. And so there's well, like this built in anxiety with that as well. It's an old school. So it's a school that I went to when I was a kid oh, and cute. they've turned where I went to high school and now into an elementary school. So, so that was oh, like, fun. yeah, they actually made it nice. Now they like repainted the walls and it looks inviting instead of dilapidated. So yeah, it's kind of weird to see my kids going into third and fifth grade where I took honors pre-calc. It's just, yeah, like, Whoa, that would be weird. But yeah, it's the first year that all four of the Oakley kids are out of the house. We could have not built a home. We could have just stayed in our old house and I could have continued no. working out of that 10 by 10 bedroom. That is but such a wanna, dude thing. Do you want to go back? <laughs> no, no, I don't want to go back. <laughs> all right, let's get into it. Well, welcome to episode 299. Holy crap. I know. 299. Wow. I'm Kevin Oakley and with me today is Julie Jarnigan and Beth Russell. Hello. Hi. 299. Man, um, maybe we just cancel all episodes until the summit and record it, episode 300 mm. at the summit. Now that won't work, will it, Olivia? Because uh, we already have guest episodes, I think, teed up and coming. So Yeah, it's hmm. probably too far. But is it sad that like my first thought is that's a lot of hours of Kevin Oakley? Uh, yeah. Now yeah, we're really close to just creating Kevin GPT and letting him run the show. No doubt about it. Like fake. I'm never going to have to write a book again. I'll just, you know, listen to all of this and figure out something that makes sense and put it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just transcribe all of the previous episodes. Yeah. I, I, I have actually had that thought that like when I die, my family will be able to easily recreate me with all the content that exists. That is disturbing. It might be in, it might be in lo fi, not like full 12 K or whatever they're at by that time hologram, but like, well, maybe for hologram purposes, here we go. Okay, <laughs> there so you now go. You can recreate me exactly. <laughs> you, have, have you ever gone back to listen to some of the old episodes just to oh, see like how far you've come? I did. I, the only episode I've re listened to a couple times is episode four, I think, which was, about struggling community analysis because mm -hmm. um, I just it's such a fun topic for me but it's I mean the audio quality is different there was no video and I think episode seven analytics might be like McDonald's I think it's episode seven or 11 maybe Andrew recorded with me live in my basement at like <laughs> one in the morning or something that was also a memorable episode anyway wow. yeah Shout out to our graphics too, changing over time because I saw that episode four graphic and I was like, wow, that seems like forever ago. Yeah, well, that was, that was me talking, producing, editing, publishing, uploading. All it was a lot that. of work. Mm. And now I don't do any of it. I just show up. It's so amazing. Thank you, Olivia. Shout out, <laughs> Olivia. And, and Jackie before Olivia. Jackie <laughs> yeah. did it for a long time as well. So story time. Julie, I, we have to start with yours. I don't, I want to know what this is. The, the so, show, show notes just say bad parenting advice and I'm all, I'm all here for that. Mm -hmm. So like I said, we were about a week into school and uh, my oldest just started high school. So that's been a whole new thing. And like a weekend he has had 
like practice, band practice every single night. Then we have jujitsu after that. Then just everything being new. We never know the schedule. We never know anything. And he's one of these kids like, everything's fine. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's good. And then he just has a meltdown when he can't handle it anymore. So (laughs) last night was the meltdown. Like he was overwhelmed. Like I'm never going to have time at home ever again in my life because just (laughs) he gets up like early, early because school starts early and then has dinner and goes to bed. So he got in bed last night and I went in there and this is probably not how other parents would handle it. I was like, buddy, you know how all these years we have said, give it your all, do your best, work as hard as you can. I said, that's a lie. Mm -hmm. I was like in math, math, you need to give a hundred percent, do your best in math, in band, you know, a solid 75% is fine. I was like, that's fine. You don't have to do your best because he's just on like on all day and trying to be Mm -hmm. happy and trying to work hard. And it was just too much. And so I would say that to all of us, like it's a lie to say you can do your best work as hard as you can in every single area of your life all day long. At some point you have to get to be like right now, this is the priority and I've got to give this my all and I have to give this my hundred percent, this other thing, I'm just going to kind of write it out and save my energy and, um, make it through this season. So that was my bad parenting advice is don't do your best. Like there's certain areas right now. Don't do your best in those areas. Do your best on the stuff that matters and ignore the worst. That's always good advice. And I think there's two parts to that too. It's one is a conservation of energy, like you're talking about. And the other is maybe you're mediocre in something or, or meh, as the kids say, mid, um, I think that's what the kids say. I don't know. I'm out of touch. That sounds right. But they, the other part of it is if you happen to be mid at something, just understanding that that's okay. And, and like it, it might, where where I'm connecting that at least is my oldest daughter, Avery is on the varsity soccer team. She doesn't start. She gets a good amount of playing time uh, each half. But she doesn't come off at the end of the game and like, I can't believe I didn't start or I'm going to like, it's just, she knows more or less that she hasn't put in the same amount of work that the, that the starters have put in and played as many years in club and the rest. And so she's happy to be there. She's happy to be part of the team, happy to contribute, wants to do best she can, but she's not trying to conserve energy. She's just okay being there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you yeah. Really have being to able pick, to accept it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're only going to excel in a few areas. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's my it's been a little bit of a roller coaster <laughs> this week as we adjust. But we're I we're kind of want there. your next book to be like a sarcastic parenting advice book. Yes. <laughs> like, she would do that. Sign well. me up for that. All right. Sarcastic I'll anything. Sarcastic Julie is the best Julie. <laughs> without a doubt. Beth, what do you got? Um, I guess it's just another house update. It's all like Oh, I'm, don't downplay it. That's what people love. That's their I know. favorite. But it was so funny. Julie and I were talking before the show and I was like, I don't really have a story. I was like, my life is boring. And she was like, you, you just got a closing date. Your house isn't even finished. Like, how is that boring? And I'm like, okay, you're right. (laughs) Like, Snap back to reality. Um, But our house is nearing completion. We have flooring going in today. I snuck over during um, hours that they were working because they lock us out at night now which is fun. Good for them. I love yeah. it when they do that. I'm, I'm not so, being sarcastic. It freaks me out when it's not locked. I Once agree. it gets to that point, I'm just like, what's, I mean, the house that just got built down by us, never locked, never nothing, not even like a fake sign or like a fake camera or, and it, I just, I couldn't. Ooh. Yeah. It not being locked would cause me anxiety. Like I understand that, but the like control freak and obsessive compulsive. Uh, you know, you don't know how to break in with a credit boring. card. They never Teach taught you me. that style craft. Oh no, man. They didn't. Just, I could probably know. figure out a hair clip. Maybe if, if they haven't moved it over to the real lock set, you can absolutely get in with a credit card. Yeah. It's totally a spec key. So oh, like yeah. I got to figure out something. I, I know the secret I can. window unlocked. They won't oh, notice. my husband has tried. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That means you got a great project manager when they're catching that stuff. Yeah. It's great. It's pretty good. I love it. But I definitely did sneak in today while workers were there. So <laughs> not sorry. Um, but we have a closing date, which is exciting. And it's only a couple weeks away. 
um, there's still a lot to be done. So I'm like over here wondering, you know, at this point, typically you're starting to do like your blue tape walkthrough where you're catching things so they have time to fix things should they need to be fixed. So I don't know if that's part of the process or not. I, I'm just flying. You know, by the hold on, because here. I'll tell you the the builder that we acquired, um, they, they didn't build a whole lot of homes. It was like 25 to 30 homes when we bought them. We bought them mostly for land positions in Raleigh. Um, they had a zero defect home policy, which mm. basically meant when we deliver you your house, it's going to be done 100 percent we'll have walked through it and so they didn't they did not incorporate a blue tick now certainly there's things that you're going to find that wasn't the point the point was when you move in we're going to go through it enough times with a fine tooth comb that it's going to be a zero defect house then you're going to live in it and things are going to happen and we're going to take care of it but it was a totally different mentality than it would be kind of and it is a little bit i mean this is where the goal came from anyway was imagine if you you rolled up at the you know, the caddy dealership and they were like, here's your brand new car. Just walk around and mark all the stuff that's wrong with it first. And then mm -hmm. we'll take care of it. You know? Yeah. So yeah. it is for those of us who are used to the, the walkthrough and give us your feedback and then get, create the final list and then check it off. It is unusual, but hopefully that's what they're doing. I mean, let's hope. So I'm excited. It's funny though. So we met our neighbors who are building a house right next door to us. Um, and she was like, did you lock in your rate? And we were like, yeah. And she goes, how bad did it hurt? And I was like, it mm. hurt. And it's funny I because know. I was like thinking about, we talk about this every single week. I like know what's going on. I know a lot about the industry. I know all of these things, but it doesn't take away the pain of that happening. And so, yeah, I'm. it's going to be, it's it's rough. Yeah. Can we talk about that for a second then too? Yeah, Which, let's, this let's is this be is my why therapist, I can't, Kevin. Well, this is why I can't be a salesperson, I don't think, and that this isn't a knock on salespeople either. I'm just saying you have to you have to position things in the best light for the for the product you're selling. I don't know. There's I've talked before about how my one of my college professors said that it was immoral to be in marketing. So I guess you know the same thing applies to us. But the buy the house date the right thing. Um you know, if someone has a two one or three one arm, you know, I, I didn't, I should have screenshotted this, but there was an article that just came out, I think in Forbes that said like 70 or 80% of people who purchased in any point in 2022 mm -hmm. expected rates to be back down by now. Mm -hmm. And they're still going higher, uh -huh. uh, expected to be at 8%, not in the not too distant future. And again, that's without fed action on, on the overnight funds rate. So um the counterpoint again is of course you got the lower rate than yep. what it's going to be if and it keeps what going it is higher, right now it can't get worse no <laughs> for you <laughs> but i mean i don't know could, if that makes what, her feel what better if, i think what also if, it hurts more because we just bought a house in 2021 and that was a va loan so naturally the the rate was a little bit lower as well mm -hmm. and so and you can't you do that this, again because you no, have you have in a VA loan, you you can max out your eligibility, hmm. and so essentially that our eligibility is maxed out, Got and it. so this house we had to go conventional, which is fine, but it's again it's just different because we have that fresh wound from purchasing in twenty twenty one, right, and then only end up living in that house for a year. Yeah, I get, well I get back to the scenario I was trying to talk about uh, before I distracted myself is <laughs> if someone had told you no beth it's okay just buy the house and date the rate how would you feel right now can you put yourself in that fake scenario and be like salesperson said don't worry rates are going to come down and i bought anyway how do you feel you're like eh, it's not their fault or would you be like Arr. i don't appreciate that saying because it's not personal to our experience because like I just said, mm -hmm. we bought a house in 2021. We only ended up living there for a year and the army moved us. We should be here for three years. We could be here longer. So because we don't know the time frame, it's not a long-term commitment for us like it is for other people. 
We have Mm. no idea the term commitment we have for this one. And if we'll keep it and rent it or if we'll, you know, sell it, who knows? So the rate is a little bit more important to our family scenario because of the risk involved with it, with just how our lives are. Yeah. I know, I think I talked about this on a, on a podcast episode, but just in case I didn't, Barbara Corcoran went viral for a while talking about how um, prices will skyrocket when rates go down. And Mm -hmm. like the high rates are artificially keeping prices stable, Um, which in theory is true. Um, Like high rates are designed to reduce or or stop inflation. And if rates go down inflation in housing, which is what price appreciation is um, for the most part, could go up. But also, I just think it's really hard. The summary of all this randomness, and I'll get to my story, is it's hard, I think, as a salesperson to know without that specific context. There is not a great one-liner to talk about interest rates, affordability, yeah. mortgages. You really have to understand the individual scenario because like the, the Barbara Corcoran scenario sounds great. And yet if rates go down sooner than later, it's probably because people are losing their jobs. And when they lose their jobs, then they probably have to move again, which means you have more people who are in the situation of needing to or wanting to sell their home, which the fact that that's not happening is actually what's keeping prices higher. Mm-hmm. Like you could, you could argue either way, prices are artificially being held higher by lower supply of houses overall, which mm-hmm. if rates go down, more people might choose to sell, which might actually increase supply. So anyway, it's just hard to know how to, how to, how to use those. Well, um, my real quick story is that, uh, AI is not going to solve your people problem. You know, so I had a call with a builder today who, uh, we don't work with on the marketing side, but it was a, it was like a training call with the, they have a new corporate VP of sales They're hiring regional sales managers. And as we're talking through everything and the company from, from all appearances and what I know about them, everything, like I, I would assume near perfection in processes, but we're talking about uh, CRM usage and how sales managers and, and corporate sales could use the market proof algorithm and the CRM and everything to kind of keep an eye on what's going on. And it just goes back to, well, salespeople aren't putting any of our customers in the CRM. It's like, hmm. AI is not solving that, that people problem, you know, and they, now they were still using paper registration cards. We talked about the, the need to reduce duplicate work by having digital registration, but even, even then, I don't know. I just think it's, I keep coming back to with artificial intelligence and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, AI today than we have in, in other episodes lately. It keeps coming back to two fundamental issues. One is it's, it's not able to solve people problems. And two, it's not able to um, make people adapt to change, which maybe they're the same problem. But, you know, all day long, and Beth, you've gotten to experience, experience this now for almost six months. Mm-hmm. Uh, Julie's uh, been here for several years. Like, it's identifying the issues is not the hard part. Yeah. And identifying the two or three best potential solutions is not the hard part. <laughs> the hard part is getting senior leadership to agree or to be willing to make the, the changes that are necessary. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to solve that either. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. they can tell a creative story and, and maybe given enough good data, they can create some convincing arguments, but I just, what I think is interesting is if I wrote out exactly the points I was going to make, and this is going to sound slightly egotistical, but if I wrote out all the points that I was about to make and I gave it to, um, I don't know, my, my wife, like she can, she can say the same data points, make the same story. Mm-hmm. There's still something about the human delivering it. Absolutely. And there's the different voices of people delivering and how they deliver it, like putting their own personal touches on it. Just like the fact that we have four different coaches and all of us are saying the same message, but e- each of us have our own unique way yeah. of delivering that message. I actually, I feel like someone should make, you know, remember the Holiday Inn Express commercials 
Uh, are you like a mechanical engineer? No, but I did say in a Holiday Inn Express last night. Remember those from like 10 oh, years yeah. ago? I haven't thought I, about those in a long time. Well, isn't AI going to be kind of the same thing of like, hey, um, this is fantastic information. How did you come up with this? Are you like, if you've been in the industry for 20 years and worked with hundreds of, of different organizations? No, but I plugged it all into AI and it said so. Like, how is the implementation going? Yeah. <laughs> and that, I just think it's, it's kind of funny. It can be right, but it almost like, how does being right matter? Sometimes it's, mm -hmm. that's not the hard part. Um, and then the other half of my story time is the Marker Proof Academy is going on. Uh, so Andrew and Sarah are, are doing that. And I just got this piece of feedback uh, from one of the attendees that I thought was awesome. It's always fun to hear people's uh, feedback because like builders who are like, yeah, I build that floor plan all the time and, and I walk through it all the time and I kind of get desensitized to it. It's, even for us, we're like, yeah, GA4 and, and this and that, no big deal. <laughs> this person said, I'm so pleased with the first two days I wasn't sure what to expect being that I've been doing, and she used air quotes, this for nearly 10 years and 10 years for, for a pretty large organization. And so that's a lot of years of experience, but it's been well worthwhile and I'm really looking forward to the second half. So even someone who's you know been doing this for 10 years um, is kind of like, hey, after half of the academy, I got my money's worth and then some. Uh, it's just so cool to hear that. I love it. Good job. Andrew and Sarah. All right, on to the news. First up from ZillowGroup.com. Zillow Group to acquire Spruce, a tech-enabled title and escrow company, as yet another building block in the housing super app. Zillow and Spruce together will power a modern closing experience. So again, super app is what Zillow is trying to build, and they are just keep adding pieces to the puzzle um, it's pretty, pretty cool. I, I I'm going to have Olivia add a link to the show notes of a video interview, um, with Jason Calacanis on this week in startups with Rich Barton, uh, uh, founder and CEO of Zillow group. And you should definitely don't watch Netflix. Don't watch Hulu. Don't watch HBO. What's, what is it? Max now? I don't, it's just max, right? Yeah. Max. A terrible branding move. Everyone agrees on that. But um, they're serious about this, and I think um, it's, the, it's the right move for them to make. But one of the things that, that Jason asked uh, Rich about is, talk again about COVID. Like this ha it had to have just been crazy, terrible time to be the CEO of a company like Zillow that's so dependent on consumer behavior and buying and selling homes and just the, like you couldn't go tour anything for a while. And, and again, we've all lived through it, but Rich's reaction was, it was like, it's actually been kind of fun, if I can use that word. Like there are opportunities to just break down walls and he uses um, mortgage and title and closing services. If there's just like, no, you can't do that remotely. Oops, we have to do it remotely somehow because we can't get people together. And uh, really COVID, I'll have to go back and double check, but, but it feels to me like this whole concept, no, actually, it does line up. So they closed Zillow offers in 2021, I mm -hmm. believe, after what no one has ever said this, but I, I believe is just a, a back alley secret handshake of like, hey, if we stop doing this, Open Door, will you partner with us? And Open Door was like, well, heck yeah, you're mucking up the whole like landscape with this ultra competitive eye buying program. So yeah, we'll just we'll partner together and the two have been working pretty closely ever since then. But when they shut down Zillow offers, Wall Street was like, well, so what's the big growth engine of Zillow? And the answer back was, we're going to make a super app. And um, again, I, I pose this question with a different group of co-hosts, but if I was buying or selling a house and I was on Zillow and Zillow said for 50 or a hundred bucks, we will be your one-stop shop for everything and we'll keep everything organized and we'll tell you everything you need to know and we'll connect you with all the best highly rated people for each part of this process, you can do it all digitally or in person, however you want. We'll give you exclusive access to X, Y, and Z. And like it wouldn't take a whole lot of extra things for me to just say, yeah, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Sign yeah. me up. Yeah. yeah you know who... Go ahead. It's comparative to their, their rental 
platform in my eyes, having personal experience with it, because we have two houses. One, we have a property manager for, and so all of the vetting and the marketing and whatever, when that, when that listing goes live, goes through them. And then we have another house where we're just the property managers for, and I put it up on Zillow through their rental platform. And then it vets them. It can run a credit report. It can accept applications, all this stuff. And it's super easy for me to the point where I'm like, do I even need that property manager anymore? Because that's just a pain in my butt sometimes. And there's a middleman that I have to deal with. Whereas in this case, I just deal with the people one-on-one and we handle things as they come along. And I have open communication. I know exactly what's going on. I know exactly how my house looks. And I can talk to these people one-on-one before they move into our home. And it's just all automated through Zillow. And it makes my life honestly a lot easier. Yeah. Do you know who I think will be slow to embrace this kind of change? Do you know who I'm going to (laughs) say? I mean, so many. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Realtors. I think realtors are going to cringe at this and I don't think they're going to like it. And they mm-hmm. like their old school taking um, the closing title company out to lunch. And um, so I think that's that's the community that's going to be slow to embrace this. Yeah, 100%. Zillow's enhanced listing program with Showing Time Plus, I think is a big part of getting closer to agents. And I'm going to actually do a whole deep dive on Again, uh, you know, Zillow is a is a partner of the summit. They don't tell me anything they don't want people to know. So it's not like I have insider. But where I think really the big picture of all this is going, just from Rich Barton's uh, phrase of the race to intimacy. But I think they're they're trying to get really close to the best agents. They they kind of mm-hmm. can't care about everyone because a lot of agents aren't good but they want the best agents to be their partners with enhanced listings, which is geographically um, limited. Only so many people can be, you know, probably by zip code. Um, I think somewhere I saw it's like $3,000 a month for a ish as an average cost. Anyway, they're going to get really close, provide all this great content for those, for those folks. And Zillow has had problems with attachment rate is what's called. So they get leads and they've tried doing mortgage and other things, but when it's not, tightly woven and connected mm-hmm. and a cohesive experience their attachment rates on on their zillow offer like they were selling the home as zillow and they still had a hard time getting people to use their mortgage company for exactly what you're talking about julie so to me this super app kind of just removes the friction as much as possible and they're going to race to intimacy with the best realtors in each area and those realtors will be okay because they're getting so much revenue that they're they'll be Kind of like, hey, I don't need the ancillary revenue that comes from all this referral, referring out closing and title and and everything else. What about those uh, super realtors, we can call them, in those areas that have their own mortgage companies Mm -hmm. tied to them? How are they going to react? Yeah, well, I think that's, again, that's the genius of, it's not Trojan horse because Zillow is being very transparent about it, but if they've got this super app, and the friction now becomes, well, you can just hit a button and get the next step of process done. And it's going to suck in all the information that you already put in when you first created an account. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, you know, Susie, a uh, realtor who wants you to use her mortgage company, you're going to have to go and redo a whole bunch of paperwork separately, show up at an office, send it. I mean, it's going to become annoying to do DocuSign if Zillow does this right. You're going to be like, yeah. DocuSign, oh. I just, it's so much more difficult than the super app. So yeah, there'll, there'll be, there'll be pushback. And I think also Rich talks uh, really well about that in the interview as well, but it's really, I mean, Zillow is uh, at a time when the used, again, the used home market's really tough right now because of the transaction volume being low, even though prices have stayed high. Mm-hmm. It's pretty impressive to see Zillow uh, investing in their business at the rate they have been with these acquisitions and partnerships. And I really think their enhanced listing program, again, like I think a lot of builders are going to be really interested in knowing more about how they can get their photography needs taken care of. Yeah. Partnership. Uh, next up from housingwire.com real estate agents grapple with a cyber attack 
on Rapatoni. A ransomware attack has crippled Rapatoni, a Southern California data host for property listing information. Santa Rosa-based Bay Area Real Estate Information Services. Whoa, they like their long acronyms in California. Uh, who are clients of Rapatoni fell victim of the cyber attack. And basically, as a result, some agents around the country are unable to add new property listings, make price adjustments, or even access the latest information for showings, according to a local outlet. That would be bad. Yes. <laughs> what a mess. If you had just listed your house right before this happened and your realtor came to you and said, well, now we can't access anything, can't get to it, don't know when it'll get fixed. Um, I think it's going to be hard for them to explain. And just the, I mean, vulnerability of feeling like how you just expect that these things are secure when you're like relying on them so much and using them. Mm -hmm. Um, and knowing that they can get hit like this. I also dug in because I was like, who are they ransoming? Like, who's going to have to, who's right. going to pay that? Um, so it said that there's insurance carriers are the ones, and then the FBI is in on it, who are trying to um, negotiate. They're negotiating with the hackers over it, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. They, so highlighted that ransomware attackers have extorted around $449 million as of June. Crazy. Potentially marking their second most profitable year after 2021. So, insane. And I think Beth, you you posted about something similar since it's in the same vein of. I feel like we should just go ahead and talk about it on the on the on the pod. Um, yeah. You know, if you get uh, on your social accounts, you're you're getting tagged by a page or an account that's called ransomware alert four three two one seven nine, or someone's posting explicit images. Uh, uh, or trying to post explicit images to your page. It's it's just a great time to make sure everything's locked down properly with two-factor authentication. And then once once you have two-factor authentication in place, you can slow down with your with your freak out moment. Like it's the first time I saw that pop up and I was like, oh my gosh, this is terrible for this company, particular organization, what's going on? And then I realized, oh, this is actually nothing, but they're trying to make you feel like it's scary so that you mm -hmm. move fast enough and, and mess something up or give something away. But it's, it's definitely happening a lot right now. Yeah. yeah it seems like, to come in waves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a big wave right now. <laughs> All right. Next up from fortune.com. Strained housing affordability is a manufactured crisis created by bad zoning. Just look at LA. Of course, this is an opinion piece. It's just this artificially created problem because we've been too down zoned. Los Angeles based real estate developer Artem Tepler told Fortune. So basically saying, look, there's obviously land, but the rules about what you can build and what it has to, uh, what materials and what size and how many people can live in each, each um, uh, home site that's, that's, developed and zoned, all of that is really why there's a housing affordability issue, mm -hmm. not due to lack of supply in terms of no one's willing to build. And that definitely, I mean, it's a, it's a very in-depth article, but it's, it's obviously true. I mean, builders want to build. That's what, that's what they <laughs> exist to do. But there are no starter homes under seven hundred or eight hundred thousand dollars anywhere in Los Angeles. Now this yeah, is like an inflated version, but in, in around the time of COVID and when prices started going up for all of the materials, Colleen, Texas, which is right outside of Fort Hood now, Fort Cavallos, where the builder I was at previously builds, they started all this legislation to require certain uh, materials on homes and that like similar to this, like they were putting all these requirements in place for new construction in the area because they wanted them to look nicer than what they were. But what was happening is like they were out pricing what everyone in the area could actually afford. And it all these people kept fighting it, kept fighting it, kept, kept fighting it. And a lot of builders who are competitors in nature are coming together and being like, we yep. cannot build this because people cannot afford it. And you're only hurting your city at this point. 
And that was just at like the 250 price point. So this is like <laughs> all the way up in the 700s, but much right. bigger scale. Right. Yeah, it said in Los Angeles, the average home value is over 900,000 and the median household income is 69,000. That's wild. Oh. Wild. So it's a yeah, drive just until you on, qualify market. Drive until you qualify. And if you do happen to have a house in the family, you just hold on to it. Or, you know, if they bought 90 years ago, you're just riding that value. Something else from that Rich Barton interview is um, his take, which seems completely correct to me, is that what's happening with urban centers is just that, yes, urban centers are generally are struggling, especially if they're separated. So if, if work is all, all done over here, this is where all the high rise office buildings are. And over here is where people live. And over here is the entertainment district. If it's not integrated and mixed, then it's really struggling. The ones that are done it well and, and integrated are, are doing great. But he's like, in those places where it's all separated, it's just created this donut effect where if you only have to be in the office twice a week, why not drive to a Ford? And so his take was, and from some of the data he's saying, it's not so much that people are making radical adjustments in where they're living. They're just going to the suburbs and the exurbs uh, to get that to get that opportunity. And I think here's, as a marketer, um, I actually don't know the companies that are under LVMH. I have a feeling maybe one of you two do. LVMH is the parent company of, I think, Coach and, oh, well, let's, we're on a computer so I can find out. <laughs> um, the owner of LVMH is the most uh, wealthy individual in the world. And they have 75 different brands, apparently. Let's see. Uh, there should be. Oh, I think my cousin worked for them. They got, wow. Wine and spirits, fashion and leather goods. Let's look at the fashion and leather goods. Just give yeah. them a name. Low, Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton, Ramoa. Fendi. Right. So it's high-end luxury stuff. And all that LVMH really has to do is create artificial scarcity. Like you walk in and you want a handbag and they say, oh, well, we could get that handbag for you in seven months. Now, <laughs> there is no reason they couldn't make a handbag for you in two weeks or less but it's artificial scarcity that drives up value. And that's really what the article to me is saying is you're creating artificial scarcity, which is good for those of you who have it terrible for everyone else who doesn't. And the incentives just don't line up. If, if you own one of those homes, you don't have an incentive to want and that, and that, that really, again, everyone I think knows that I'm a libertarian, just leave the government out of everything. But to me, that's, that's where the government has to, has to, has to have some understanding of all the incentives are aligned for the people who have, and there does need to be an opportunity for, for some affordable options within a, within a certain population, I think. But, and I think it's just seems, telling how much power, like the local, the local governments have over these things. We had another article. I don't know if we're talking about it now or not. That was the same thing, good or bad. Um, yeah the local governments have can affect our industry so much and just, you know, um, the living situation of so many people. Yep, exactly. It was, uh, we took it out for sake of time, but it was about Minneapolis as being the first city that, um, has inflation at or under 2%, mostly driven by a real focus on, uh, affordable housing and, a, a, a f availability of housing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the, uh, in the city. Yeah, they, put, yep. they actually invested in rental, affordable rental opportunities within the city. So this is what's interesting to kind of just sit on this article from a different perspective again is artificial scarcity sounds a little bit like uh, a certain book that's behind me <laughs> here, <laughs> uh, Pre-Sale Without Fail, right? Now, it's actually not artificial, but it is highlighting the, the, the actual scarcity that exists of every home site can only be sold once and they are all unique. Mm -hmm. And so highlighting scarcity is always an important thing to do. Creating artificial scarcity, that I think borders on manipulation, right? Like 
artificial scarcity in the context of a community would be marking 10 of your 13 home sites as sold or reserved when none of them are. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, so, so scarcity is, is good. Our artificial scarcity that lies on the border of deviant and something else. And it's a fine line. I think people convince themselves that they're they're walking that fine line. But like you said, marking 10 as sold when they aren't really sold is different from saying we're only releasing 30 this phase when you know you have another phase of 30 coming on at yeah. some point. Like that's mm -hmm. true. You just don't right. have that phase released yet. So And I mean, I'm not I, I used to tell all my salespeople um, I'm interested in any home you have. You, I'm just one person, but I'm always interested in a home. So if you want to tell someone that there's someone else interested, I am, I am interested in all of our homes. So I'm not saying I'm as perfect either, but yeah. all right. Um, I, I, I want to take a break from the show notes just to, there is a, um, uh, newsletters that I subscribe to where they just highlight interesting things that are going on. And one of the things that this gentleman highlighted was that there had been an in-depth study about how Facebook adoption was proven scientifically through this research to not be detrimental to people's well-being. And in fact, it was ended up being positive, just slightly positive, the more that Facebook adoption was in place in a particular country. So they 72 different countries participated in the study and they found a direct correlation to more Facebook active users, happier, well, well, I don't know about happier, but, but overall better well-being for the population. And I was like, cool, I want to check this out. And they, he included a link to the study. Here's what the, um, here's what the study looks like. It's from the Royal Society of Publishing. Um, it's got an abstract, an introduction, and it's like, check this uh, math out. Um, Oh, uh, I don't even know what that character is. That's beta country. I lowercase like, uh, so I'm looking through and I'm like, oh, okay, results. Yes. Let's just read the results. And it's got these weird squiggles and graphs and it's just a highly scientific paper. And I was like, dang, I, I mean, I stared at it for a minute or two and it wasn't getting easier. <laughs> it was just getting harder. And then I thought, huh, I'm a moron. Why did I spend that time? So I go to chat, G, chat GPT four. I have a plugin installed, um, that allows you to just paste in a URL. And I just said, please summarize the findings from this article. And it put it into night two, two nice paragraphs that helped me understand that the study went from 2008 to 2019, included 72 countries, almost a million individuals, individual responses. And the study found general positive associations between country level Facebook adoption and well being, which were partially qualified by demographics and not uniform across countries. Um, and it just made it into perfect English. And I was like, this is, this is still why AI is, is a great thing, even a, as limited as it is right now. We have That's a question. Beth and I are laughing because we've had this conversation on Slack just here recently. Oh, really? So apparently yeah. that only works now if you pay for the, yes. you still pay for the, yeah, it doesn't work anymore. I canceled and then I had to go back and pay for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause mm -hmm. I was like, this will save me enough time. And I got, I think, was it five bucks a month or something? See, and now I'm angry. I don't want to pay mm -hmm. that. Why? You can understand, look, I don't think like Einstein himself service. could like, understand <laughs> the, the math of this, of this paper. No, I agree with you. They're like, I agree with you, but I also am stubborn and I don't want to pay that $5 mm. to summarize my articles, even though I tried to summarize an article today and it didn't yeah, well, let me do it. I, here's something that I promise be, due to inflation, everyone on, listening, no matter where you are, if you are still in college your time is worth more than five dollars a month if you use this tool right so yeah. just like uh why, why do we take ubers instead of taxis or why do we you know um i don't i don't know i don't door dash because i'm stubborn in that way i just yeah. refuse to pay to someone to deliver food to me <laughs> but 
that I'm, I'm stupid in doing that because me driving 15 minutes to go pick up Chinese takeout is not worth my time. I mean, again, back to we're all going to die. I mean, do you want to use 0.001% of your life to try to understand this article or just plug it in and get the answer? Look, Kevin, I'm about to close on a house. I just locked in that rate. I can't afford an extra five dollars a month right now. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. All right, All just right. to bring it full so circle. That that does um, that does bring us back though to what I wanted to talk about, which is um, you do have to now in ChatGPT four. Um, if you're paying for access, you can enable plugins. There is a plugin store. Um, there are now, gosh, I guess tens of thousands of different plugins that you can use. Um, here's the ones that I have currently installed, uh, access Google sheets, ask your PDF. It lets you analyze any PDF documents, Expedia, because if you're going to use uh, chat GPT to help it all with travel plans, Expedia plugins, fantastic Google trends data, um, make a, make a Google sheet. So it can not just access sheets, but then make me a new sheet based upon data. Um, notable, which is for Python, SQL and markdown data, show me diagrams, create and edit diagrams directly with the chat. Wikipedia, WebPilot, which is um, the one that lets you browse uh, any website that you can pull up. Show Notes turns long podcasts into quick summaries, find specific information, highlights key points, et cetera. Zapier, of course, then lets you plug into almost any other uh, piece of software. So the okay, plugins do make, it, do, do, do make it worth it. In fact, um, just yesterday, um, Sarah from Texas that's all I have permission to share because I didn't ask it. She was like, yeah, I use ChatGPT for all of, she was driving, I think from Texas to Arizona and wanted to stop at three different places. Cause she has, she was taking, I think her mom and her daughter with her. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, plan me out three stops for appropriate for these ages. And she was like, it was fantastic that, you know, it broke it up evenly, found something of interest that wasn't far off the route. So, I think for parlor tricks, again, more or less, and, and some time efficiency, it really is, AI is, is here and is helpful. But leading us to our last article um, from CNN.com, self-driving cars were supposed to take over the road. I'm going to add, what the heck happened? So, you know, basically self-driving um, started through a Pentagon um, funded uh, contest in 2007. Then you have companies like Algo and Waymo um, from Google and others all saying, look, this is going to be a real thing. More than $10 billion has been invested in self-driving cars since 2010, according to a McKinsey estimate. And then Ford um, and General Motors, General Motors promised in 2017 mass production of fully autom autonomous vehicles by 2019. Lyft said in 2016 that half of its ride volume would be self-driven by 2021. Ford said that by 2021, full self-driving vehicles would be deployed broadly. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, as of right now, if we round up or down, doesn't matter, there's exactly 0% self-driving cars um, for sale for consumers. There are self-driving cars in certain markets and, and they're still being tested and rolled out. Although it was hilarious that in San Francisco, there's a street that was blocked for a half hour because of an ongoing concert that was sucking all of the cell service in the area. So the cars couldn't talk back to the mother shop ship and they just sat the there for 30 minutes. But like this whole thing about the hype cycle, I just think self-driving cars are a perfect example of they are real. They exist in some markets, um, but they were promised to be fully rolled out or over 50% of cars on the road, I think by 2021, would be fully self-driving. And here we are. So what's, what's going on? Why don't yeah. we have it? I thought it was interesting that they talked about how there's essentially an infinite number of scenarios that they can't predict that happened so quickly while on the road that that is playing a factor because ultimately in order to have a bunch of self-driving cars on the road, you would actually need to take all the humans out of the loop and you wouldn't be able to have any humans driving on the road at the same time as these self-driven vehicles because humans add too many unpredictable variables 
into the scenario. Um, exactly right. But it's already been proven, been, I'm going to use air quotes, proven that autonomous driving is safer, generally speaking, than letting humans drive, mm -hmm. which brings us almost full circle of AI is here, it could solve the problem, but we're not going to. And I think what's really interesting is the why we're not going to is because it's a life or death impact on if it does well or not does well. Yeah. And that that risk being so high, it's unacceptable. Even at 0.009% of the time, something bad happens. We're not gonna we're not gonna give up, even though again, it's completely irrational because right now three or four times that amount of bad things happen because we have humans behind the wheel who are eating, drinking, doing makeup, whatever, oh. um, using their cell phone. And I think that's where I was talking about this with someone on a coaching call, a, a sales leader, and she was like, exactly. Like how long have people been predicting that we're not going to need salespeople in model homes? Yep. They just keep talking about it. And yet when it comes down to it, making sure you have revenue coming in, which is the sales team's job with marketing support, is too mission critical to just say, let the kiosk do it. By the way, the kiosk doesn't work. And it's not, it's, it's not AI. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if this is interesting to everyone else or not, but I just, I find it fascinating how um, senior leadership is still really obsessed with this idea of being caught off guard or made irrelevant tomorrow by the lack of AI adoption. Mm -hmm. And yet when you think about $10 billion being invested in self-driving, what was more important at the end of the day, self-driving or, or electric vehicles that people actually want to buy and a charging network to support them? <laughs> right? Like, one, if if they unlock it, will change the game for somebody. But in the meantime, Tesla ran away with the electric car market with the future promise of autonomous driving as well. But I just, it, it ended up being the wrong pick, I think. Yeah. And I think we're all control freaks <laughs> in a, yeah. not in a bad way necessarily. But um, I mean, I think we need to re remember this about our home buyers too. Sometimes we think they just want easy and they do want easy to some extent, but they also want to feel like they have some control. Um, mm -hmm. I think anytime you're giving people or offering people a lack of control, that doesn't feel appealing to them. Yeah. And that's yeah. what you get a lot. With Especially when that lack of control is manipulated. There's that word again, by a lack of information. Yeah. I, I, I would argue that most homeowners don't really even want control over most of what's happening. They just want to feel informed and knowledgeable Mm -hmm. So that if they chose to grab the wheel from the autonomous vehicle, they could and, and impact the outcome. Yeah. And we're seeing this on websites a lot recently. Kevin, I feel like on some of the websites we've reviewed where people are attempting to force feed this automated process of purchasing mm -hmm. the home online and it's not working. You know, we have some that have the option and it's a part of their process, but it's a wonky part of their process. Yeah. And then you have others where it lives on their website and they can like fill out, like create their whole home online, which is really cool. But for the first time users coming to the website who are just like you're saying, they just want to educate themselves. They just want to look around. It doesn't make sense for them and to have that process force fed to them online right in their yeah. face. And so yeah. we just have to be really careful about how how we're using it and, and what we're forcing our customers to do in this process. Yeah. I think I always, I always think back to the example of um, people still, I think we'll talk about texting as the be all end all of everything and how texting deliverability is near hundred percent or readability. Like your customer is going to get the message and that's cool. But it, you know, you give, you give a marketer that kind of power and, 92% of marketers are going to screw that up royally. They're going to send the message at inconvenient times. They're going to fall prey to the, we need sales tomorrow, send them another one, you know, and it's just, you can't, you don't know the piss off rate. I call it of, you don't, it's not measured. Um, except for the people who text you back and say, I'm pissed off, but 
you know, for the most part, people are just like, I just want the dang notification to not read one. So they open up your thing and close it. Mm -hmm. But it's all about forward progress, not just metrics that pile up. Anyway, okay, that was fun. I liked it. I think that was a good 299th episode. Favorites, <laughs> do we have favorites ready to go? And, okay. and I also, um, I think it's also in, in honor of Julie's sarcasm. I'm okay with things you hate too. Either something you clearly hate. <laughs> Oh, you just opened up a huge you bag. Really love. Wow, Beth. Okay, <laughs> it's a dark, dark side here. Arr, she brings out the claws. No. Yeah. Um, I, you know what? I'm gonna do something I hate, but it's gonna be about just like people in a in a, in a little like a little bit. Okay. Oh, I things you hate about people. <laughs> yeah, things I hate about people. Okay, right. we're gonna start a whole new episode. No, I'm just kidding. I. I hate it when one person can taint an organization, you know, or like mm. you have like that one friend that can taint a room, that one family member that no one wants to sit by at Thanksgiving. And yep. I just, you know, there's a lot of stories of that happening right now, both like in my life, my friend's life, my husband's life. And, and I just, we forget to be kind to each other, you know? And like, it's not, it takes more effort to be mean and to be like gossipy and to spread that negative negativity than it does to just like be nice and work mm -hmm. together. So like, we should all try to do more of that. I like it. I don't know. That's the first thing that came to my mind. I feel like, um, I feel like it's time to use this. Uh, where's, where's the sound effect? Mm. Is it like the shiny, happy people sound effect or something? <laughs> No, it's the more you know, but that, I, I feel like that like was the there. PSA. Was the PSA. Um, Saturday, like a special Saturday morning, mm -hmm. something. I'm always bringing the feels. You can count on me for that. Mm, yes, you can. All right, Julie, what do you got? Oh, well, mine is my new, um, another like middle age hobby I pick up. It's really nerdy is the propagating houseplants where you can take a clipping off of something, put it in water, grow its little roots and replant it. I don't know why, but I'm into this now. Okay. And I told my family, I COVID's, feel like it's COVID like- COVID lockdown is over. You can put away the sourdough and the propagating if you want know. to, but you don't have to, Julie. I it's think okay. like when I- making little houseplant babies. Yes, yes. And I told my family, I said, um, I feel like this is my adult 4-H project and like I'm about to take it to the state fair. Because um, I've been creating new plants everywhere. So that's my new nerdy hobby I've picked up lately. I love it. I um, love that. <laughs> I want to see your plant babies. Okay. I'll send you some pictures. Okay. So my uh, favorite little consumer product of, of late is the Peak Design Wallet. So it's a little fabric. It's the same. If you're familiar with Peak Design, they make camera bags and other things. It's like some type of ballistic nylon, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's magnetic. It throws on the back of your phone and you just can lift up and then grab the cards you want. And then it pushes back down and it has a little magnetic satisfying. I play with it like all day long on calls cause I have ADD and I have to have, I tried a fidget spinner once and then it flew off and broke something. So <laughs> the magnet on this is, is the way to go instead, but it's, it's a fantastic, it's very thin. Uh, you can carry it separately. Works great. Peak Design Wallet, everybody. That's my favorite uh, product. I've but seen these. They are really cool. My favorite, um, my favorite thing that you should all be um, watching and or reading is that article, article with Rich Barton. Rich is just one of the most intelligent people. And he doesn't do a lot of interviews. He even said during this one, like, I don't like being out in the limelight very much. But this is the guy who started Expedia uh, and Zillow and Glassdoor and probably a whole bunch of other stuff. So go check out that. Uh, also, I, I just published a Builder Design or Builder um, Magazine article is now live as well. So we'll link to that and we'll talk about it next week, but for extra credit, go read it now. All right, that'll do it for this week. We'll see you next time, everyone. Bye. Bye.